A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. So glad you're with us on the program today. A little bit of a technical difficulties. My um, <clears throat> my wireless keyboard just uh, bailed out on me. So, uh, whoops, that's why the driveway's not behind me. And instead, I've got a mountain view. Uh, coming up on the program here in just a matter of moments, we're going to be talking with Tony Bernardo, the executive director of the Canadian Institute for Legislative Action, about Justin Trudeau's gun ban and uh, so-called buyback, the compensated confiscation plan, which was originally unveiled last year without a lot of details. Then the clock started ticking, but uh, there weren't a lot of details about how this so-called buyback was going to work. Well, we've got legislation now that's been introduced in the House of Commons, but uh, still a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, Tony Bernardo has some questions as well. Take a look and a listen. Tony Bernardo, thank you so much, sir, for coming on the program. It's good to talk to you today. And you too, Cam. Always a pleasure. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. I wish the news was better, but uh, Justin Trudeau uh, dropping this uh, 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 gun control bill in the House of Commons on yesterday. Uh, we, we've known that this was coming, right? It was last May that he announced, all right, we're, we're banning 1,500 models of uh, firearms, but uh, we'll, we'll give you the details on the uh, quote-unquote buyback later. And right. there were some details, it seems, uh, in, in yesterday's legislation, but not a lot of details about how this compensated confiscation is supposed to work. No, no, there, there, there's no detail in there about the compensation other than a notation that details will come later. But the clock is ticking now, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, didn't the clock start last May? Yes, it did. That's a two-year window. So we're coming up on the one-year part very quickly. So half, nearly half of this two-year window has gone by. The government still hasn't said, all right, here's how you're supposed to give us your guns. Um, Tony, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that uh, gun owners, uh, first of all, I know they're not happy about the, uh, the gun ban itself. But, you know, look, even gun control advocates have to be a little ticked off at how chaotic uh, their, their big plans have been rolled out. No, actually, they're furious because the government promised them they would confiscate these firearms, and now they're 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 talking about the option of keeping them. They're going to let certain people keep them. The reason being is money. I mean, the money is astronomical. How many firearms do you think we're talking about uh, that have been banned in in Canada as a result of a Trudeau's actions? I, I would guess seven to eight hundred thousand. Okay. Okay, that's a fair number. And the only reason you have to guess is because, of course, as you know, we defeated our long gun registry. Mm -hmm. And many of the firearms they moved onto the prohibited list are non-restricted long guns. So they don't know who's got what. Gotcha. Okay, right. so without that gun registration, again, they, they, as you say, they don't know who owns what guns, so they can't say, uh, you know, Mr. Bernardo, we're showing up to your house, we're going to uh, take your guns from you. Uh, instead, it's Mr. and Mrs. Canada will tell you at some point how you can turn them in. Uh, but but let's talk about the keeping your your guns part, because <laughs> as I understand it, while while the compensated confiscation is is voluntary, so to speak, if you keep your gun, you basically have to turn it into a paperweight. That's correct. It becomes a safe queen. You know, then then you're just biding your time waiting for a friendly government to come into force so they can reverse this nonsense. Okay, so that that's really what they're anticipating. They're trying to get it so that people can keep the things. Um, you know, a lot of people will. But we have this experience of, of this happening 25 years ago when they introduced the infamous C-68. There were several categories of firearms, like converted full autos, that you were allowed to keep grandfathered. But you literally could not shoot them, couldn't take them out of the house, couldn't do anything but pull them out of the safe once in a while and fondle them. Uh, and, and those people now are, are presenting a very bitter voice of experience as to what this is actually like. Because those guns have been dead for 25 years. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's a very ugly scenario. And the Trudeau government, like everything else they do, are not being completely honest and transparent. You know, they're, they're telling the, the general public that, oh, yeah, you know, this is going to be really easy to achieve. 
But let me tell you, it's not easy to achieve, and it sure as hell isn't cheap. Well, absolutely. I mean, look, I mean, <laughs> look, if this were going to be easy to achieve, then the Trudeau government would have come up with a plan to achieve it. Uh, right. And they would have released it a year ago or at least last May, um, right. you know, and instead they clearly don't know. They know what they want to do, but they clearly haven't figured out a way to do it. No, that's right. And and I don't know how they're going to figure out a way to do it. The The New Zealand model is the one that they have so far been citing. But New Zealand's a tiny little country. And Canada is not. If we were to go with a collection station for these firearms every 200 miles, we're looking at 14,000 collection stations in Canada. Each one, each one staffed by three or four police officers, a few clerks, and an evaluator who makes an evaluation as to how much your, your actual gun is really worth. So a guy with a brand new you know, Bushmaster that hasn't even been fired yet is getting an appropriate price over a guy who's got one that's just beat to death, right? Yeah. Right. So 14,000 of these. We have 80,000 police officers in Canada. <sighs> and, you, and, and you're going to use up 45,000 to 60,000 police officers per shift to man the collection <laughs> stations. Just the collection stations. Just the collection stations. And, of course, there's not going to be anybody writing tickets or catching bad guys, right? Yeah. And yeah. What, do you, what do you think our police services think of that idea? Well, exactly. And, again, the folks in you know uh, places like Vancouver and Toronto where we've seen an increase in violent crime – what do they think too? We're gonna, you know, they they might be all in favor in theory of uh, this gun ban, but you know, yeah. we actually talk about how this is gonna work and pulling police resources. Where would they rather have those police officers standing on a corner somewhere trying to collect people's guns, or right. actually investigating who's responsible for committing these violent acts so that they can make arrests, get convictions, and take them off the street? Right, and like everywhere else in the free world, police training is suffered pitifully. Okay. Right now, a serving police officer qualifies once a year. They get two boxes of carbine ammunition, 5.56, five, and they get one box of 9mm per year. They are not permitted to buy their own ammo to train with their own duty guns. Matter of fact, they're not permitted to use their duty guns at all other than that. So what many of our police officers, and I mean many, have done They've got, uh, gone out and purchased on their own dime AR-15 carbines and whatever pistol their service happens to use. But, you know, like, like the U.S., it's a hodgepodge everywhere, not mm -hmm. all one. And they, go, they join gun clubs, and they go out and they train with these duplicate firearms in order that they have proficiency. When the, when the time comes, they need them. Now they're getting their guns banned. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. No, yeah. no exception for the privately owned farms of police officers in this no, legislation. No well, I mean, if, look, from a consistency standpoint, I, I, I can't necessarily disagree with that. But again, I'm not in favor of this ban to begin with. So um, but I can imagine that the uh, the the police forces there in Canada uh, none too happy about this. Yeah, now, I, I, I think Pest would describe it better. Uh, well, there you go. <laughs> So what about what about this provision as well? Uh, and I know that this is something that Trudeau had mentioned last May um, and something else that gun control activists uh, are not necessarily happy about. They wanted more. They wanted just a complete ban on handguns across right. the entire country. Uh, right. Instead, uh, this legislation would allow cities and municipalities to do so at the local level. Right. And what a catastrophic idea. Like this is a train wreck looking for a place to happen. You know, one one of the advantages that Canada's gun control system has had over the U.S. gun control system is that the laws are uniform from coast to coast. Okay, everybody has the same laws, so you know you you, you can you can easily figure out what you what you're doing as opposed to in the U.S. where every state has its own patchwork quilt of some federal, some state laws, some municipal laws. We've never had that problem. Now we're going to have that problem. 
However, all of our municipalities are subject to provincial regulation. And the provincial governments are saying, no, 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 that's that, that's not going to happen. I mean, it'll happen in Quebec, sure as God made apples, right? Mm-hmm. But I mean, it, it's not going to happen in most of the country. Nobody wants to wade into this quagmire. No one yeah. wants to. I read yesterday that there were five provinces that have hired their own uh, firearms officers, yes. uh, basically you know, bypassing the, the federal system because they don't agree with this. And I was reminded of the Second Amendment sanctuary movement that we've seen uh, here in the United States. I, I don't think the two are, are completely um, uh, similar, but it does seem like you are starting to see that that local and provincial resistance uh, legal resistance to uh, to these uh, uh, mandates coming down from the federal government. Well, uh, absolutely, and, and you know, especially in the West, um, Alberta's in the process of, of hiring its own chief firearms office uh, officer, and so is Manitoba. Ontario already has one. Uh, Saskatchewan just hired one, and uh, the the guy they hired is well known to us, and he's a former board member. So, <laughs> you know, the the guy he actually knows about guns. He actually knows about them, you know. Yeah. And, and is not an anti in any way, shape, or form. Now, understand, though, that because we have one uniform set of laws coast to coast, his job is to enforce the Federal Firearms Act. So he has a lot of latitude in things like business inspections or range inspections and stuff like that. But he doesn't have a lot of latitude over what the law is. Okay, gotcha. The law is law, so he has to enforce that. Uh, however, it, it is a sea change. It is a sea change because you now have somebody who's working on behalf of shooters, not against them. Yeah, absolutely. That, you know, we were you and I were talking earlier about this uh, search and seizure without a warrant. The, this is this is huge. They they have now expanded red flag laws to be basically the one eight hundred snitch on your neighbor line. And the response to that is a police raid with no warrant so they can take anything, that's a quote, from your home. And and, and, and anybody can start that process, right? I mean, Correct. anybody can basically call the police and say, hey, I think so-and-so might be a danger to uh, themselves or others. I think they might have some guns, or maybe even some knives or whatever, uh, but you need to go take a look. And that phone call, you're telling me that phone call alone is enough for the police to come in and raid somebody's home without a warrant? Right. This is insane, Tony. Absolutely. So, what, I, okay. What kind of country are we in now, you know? I, I mean, honestly, that that is a a police state. Uh, what you're talking about there, yes, sir. Um, so, how much of this is challengeable in court, and how much, uh, and, and is this something that uh, the Canadian Institute for Legislative Action is already looking at? Well, court in Canada, using the courts to apply to a pro- a political problem uh-huh. is usually usually a waste of time. You know, the Department of Justice before they pass legislation. They have a team of a hundred scholarly lawyers going over every aspect of this stuff to make sure it's bulletproof. So court actions usually fail in Canada. Um, however, this particular one may not. And, and basically how it would work, we would have to wait till somebody got charged. We'd okay. Somebody lost their stuff. Then we could take it to court. And within our constitution, there's unreasonable search and seizure laws. And okay. so, but again, you've got to wait until this law passes, yeah. until it goes into effect, and until somebody's been harmed by it. Right, and has a million dollars to take it to the Supreme Court. Jeez. Okay, so you see the problem, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so... It's huge. Okay, so if the, if the, if the legal avenues um, are, are not necessarily going to be uh, a favorite ground, let's talk about the politics of this. Um the the window of this uh, amnesty to turn in your your gun, even though they don't know how you're supposed to turn it in, that ends in uh, I believe April of 2023, right? That's correct. Under Canadian law, uh, as I understand it, uh, the next election, the next federal elections, must be held by October 16th, 2023. That's correct too, but we're actually anticipating an election in the next five or six weeks. In the next five or six weeks. Okay. Um, right. See, see, they can call an election early. They just can't call one late. Gotcha. 
Okay. So, so what do you think this gun ban uh, rollout um, means for the next election in Canada? I, I think it means that to a great degree, uh, they're going to solidify some support within the cities and within the rural areas. I mean, no, no, but nobody's buying into this. I think a way bigger uh, issue will be how badly the federal government screwed up the vaccine issue. You know, okay. they, they, our, our current prime minister is a jerk. Let's let's call it right out there. He's a jerk. He's a China sympathizing, Western democracy hating communist that really, truly needs to be gone. And more and more people have realized this. The reason that we got so far behind the power curve on procuring vaccines for Canada is because he had cut a deal with the Chinese to use their vaccine, the one that doesn't work, okay? And he had cut a deal with them that they were going to supply. So he didn't go ahead when the, when the time was right and order the correct amount of vaccines from reputable suppliers around the world. Instead, he puts his, his faith in the Chinese government to come through, and of course, they don't. So now we're behind the power curve. We've got very, very few Canadians have been vaccinated. You know, and, and COVID's not epidemic in Canada like, like it is in some other places. It's big. It's mm-hmm. big. And, and, and there's no question it needs to be dealt with. But it, it, it's not like, you know, bring out your dead every night. You know, it's not one of those. Yeah. So, uh, you know, he's wearing this in the biggest way, in the biggest way. People are really angry about this. Here we are in one of the most modern democracies in the world. And this happens? Like, what the hell? Like, we have the ability to produce our own vaccines. We don't need to go buy them. Yeah. We, we've got some of the finest pharma tech in the world. Well, listen, I got to say, whatever the uh, whatever the issue, um, I, I hope that uh, when election time rolls around, yeah. um, that uh, the liberals uh, can get ousted. Um, I mean, is, is that, in your opinion, the best opportunity to defeat this legislation? Absolutely. Uh, there's no question at all. Okay. No, yeah. Like, like I said, the way our court system is designed, litigation is, is more difficult and a higher burden of proof. You can't just file a lawsuit against somebody. Okay. You know, cor- courts have to agree to hear the lawsuit all the way up the food chain. So it, it really, I mean, it's, it's a political solution that needs to be done and gun owners need to get with it and move. The, the, the thing is, is that we still have a bunch of people believing that this legislation is about black rifles. And now he's very clearly made it about black rifles and handguns, but all this stuff about search and seizure. Yeah. That, that, that's any gun. That's any gun. Your neighbor doesn't like the fact that you shoot trap and he makes a complaint and they toss your house. And when they toss your house, they really do toss your house. And there's no going back to them for compensation for damages they might have done. We've seen them rip out walls and stuff like that where they think firearms are being hidden inside the walls. I mean, it, it's just it's just insane. I mean, I don't misunderstand me because I'm not suggesting for a minute that our police are the Gestapo. They aren't. But like every other police service, if you give them too much power, eventually somebody abuses that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You, you well, and if, I, yeah, and if you're codifying that abuse into law, um, guess what? That abuse is going to be uh, more common. Hey, listen, Tony, unfortunately, we are uh, getting short on time here, but I, I want to stay in touch with you over the next few weeks uh, as okay. we start to see how this develops. Um, in the meantime, you know, 30 seconds or less, if, if there are Canadian gun owners who are watching right now, what should they be doing? They should be getting a hold of their conservative party electoral district associations. That's, that's the riding association. That is the, the grassroots association for their members of parliament. Get a hold of your conservative association, put your name on the volunteer list, pound in signs, go out there and distribute flyers, but get off your butt and do something because we're at, at the end here. This is death's door. If they, if they can manage to pull this thing off. See, we, didn't even, 
We didn't even talk about the storage loss yet. <laughs> no. Okay. So, so we got to have you back to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because again, this is, this is just uh, all kinds of awful. Uh, Tony Bernardo with the Canadian Institute for Legislative Action. Um, let's plan on talking again next week. Can we do that? Sure. Sounds good, Kim. All right. Thank you so much for your time. And again, uh, if you are a Canadian gun owner, time to get active. Uh, your voice needs to be heard. All right, I appreciate uh, Tony coming on the program, and we will have him back in the next few days with um, more details about uh, the awful legislation, C-21, that uh, just dropped in the House of Commons. Uh, and again, I, you know, I, I suspect that this is going to prod Democrats here in the United States to start moving on Joe Biden's own gun ban, even though uh, uh, on uh, Tuesday, Jen Psaki said, well, you know, it's a personal priority for uh, President Biden, but we have no... No, no uh, a real uh, firm you know, timeline as to when legislation might be introduced. Mm-hmm. I, I bet they don't. And maybe it was just uh, Joe Biden paying lip service to the idea of gun control, but I don't think so. I, I continue to believe that Biden is going to wait until the most politically opportune moment uh, to advance his gun control legislation. He said specifically on Sunday, we're not going to wait until the next mass shooting. Well, that's sort of the Democrats' MO, isn't it? When it comes to gun control, they wait until there's been one of these horrific events, and then they use that uh, as an opportunity to try to go after uh, the legally owned firearms of tens of millions of Americans. So I got to tell you, I'm, 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 I'm still, uh, my theory is that uh, that's what's going to happen with uh, Biden's gun ban bill. But there are uh, other, legis uh, other legislative agenda items that uh, Biden could start to advance executive actions that Biden promised he would impose on American gun owners and firearms manufacturers. Uh, and I think that those are likely still to come. Uh, unless, of course, you know, Biden was secretly some sort of pro-Second Amendment guy that, uh, <laughs> no, I know I, I that that that's a conspiracy theory that uh, uh, I couldn't get behind. All right, let's get to today's armed citizen story, our good deed of the day, uh, as well as our recidivist report. We'll start there with a, a story out of Illinois, an Urbana man being held in lieu of a million dollars for trying to kill his former girlfriend after forcing his way into her home over the weekend and holding her against her will. Forty-seven-year-old Lamont Jackson. I uh, expected to be facing uh, attempted murder charges as a result of uh, this uh, incident over the past weekend. According to uh, police in Champaign, Illinois, Jackson and a woman had a previous dating relationship and children in common uh, for several days last week. He allegedly threatened her at one point, telling her she should, quote, get a vest before because he was coming for her. Uh, 930 Friday night, he allegedly called her, offered to take the kids overnight, wanted to have a drink with her. She said no. Not long afterwards, that's when he is alleged to have broken into her home through the back door, confronting her in her bedroom, pointed a gun with a uh, laser sight at her, declaring, quote, today is the day, and uh, you'd never thought I'd be the one to take you out. Uh, she reported that he struck her in the head multiple times with that fire before he fired around into the floor. Over the next hour, he reportedly fired two more shots, one of which hit uh, her right lower leg, the other lodged in her mattress. He allegedly took her phone from her, uh, at one point, pointed the gun at his own head, told her to put her head close to his so one bullet would kill both of them. Uh, a woman reported it was after uh, 3 o'clock in the morning when both of them ended up falling asleep. She woke up before Jackson, found her phone, texted a friend uh, who sent police to the house around 6.30 Saturday morning. When they arrived, uh, she began screaming for help. Police entered, found Jackson, who did not comply with commands to keep his hands out of his pockets. They eventually got him into custody, found bullets, a loaded handgun magazine, a laser sight, and eventually a, a firearm as well as a several additional magazines. Uh, according to police, Jackson has prior convictions dating back to 1992. Remember, he's 47 years old. So basically his entire adult life. Uh, crimes like weapons, drug offenses, burglary, battery, domestic battery, aggravated battery, disorderly conduct. Uh, if convicted of the most serious charge of attempted murder, he could face 21 years to life in prison. We'll see if that actually happens. But uh, very, very glad that uh, this woman was able to get a hold of her phone and uh, get to police because who knows? Well, I think we all know how this story would likely have turned out otherwise. Uh, today's armed citizen story from Philadelphia, where a carjacking suspect shot by one of his victims, according to Philadelphia police. Philadelphia right now in the grips of a uh, staggeringly high violent crime rate, 499 homicides in the city last year. That was uh, one homicide away from the all-time record. It's the highest homicide total in about 30 years. Uh, this most recent defensive gun action was Monday night 
Uh, according to reports, around 6 p.m., two robbers stole a man's wallet, cell phone, and car. About two hours later, they tried to rob another man when that man pulled out a gun and opened fire, shooting one of the suspects. About 20 minutes later, police say a man in his mid-20s was uh, found nearby, suffering from two gunshot wounds to the head. He was found inside a stolen vehicle, uh, identified as a possible suspect in the uh, earlier carjacking. In the last report, he is in uh, critical condition. Uh, Chief Inspector Scott Small telling uh, 6 ABC, we're not certain at this time of the shooting victim who was inside the carjacking victim's vehicle was the actual perpetrator. However, he was in the vehicle just three hours after it was stolen. Uh, he's still going to be held as a suspect due to the fact that he was in a vehicle that was stolen in a uh, carjacking uh, at the point of a gun. The uh, armed citizen, not expected to face any charges, uh, obviously acting in self-defense. We don't know much about that armed citizen, but hopefully more details will become available in the uh, coming days. And finally today, our good deed of the day from Meridian, Mississippi, where they're in the grips of that uh, icy cold polar vortex. A lot of folks without power, a lot of folks without heat, including 93-year-old Gene Walsh, uh, who was really suffering. She was at home by herself along with her dog Pringles. Her pipes were frozen. Her power was out. No heat. She said around 3 or 4, she called 911. They said they didn't have anything to do with the power. She said, uh, I told them I could look up the number, but if they could help me, well, as it turns out, it wasn't 911 that helped Gene Walsh. It was actually Walsh's neighbor, a uh, woman named Amanda Hollingsworth, who opened up her home to anybody and everybody who needed a warm place to sleep. She said, I have three kids, and I heard that some shelters were turning away men if they didn't have money to pay. I, I, I thought of them, uh, asked my boys if they didn't have 10 or $5 that they'd be turned away. She said, that upset me, and I want to open my door to anybody that needs help. So when she heard about Gene Walsh, she reached out. She made contact. She said, I got a phone call from the Meridian Police Department. They asked me if I was still taking people in. I said, of course. I uh, said he had a 93-year-old lady named Miss Jean who needed a place. Her lights have been out since yesterday. She was almost frozen solid. He says that we brought her here, and we finally got her thawed out this morning. So in the right place, quite literally, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing, uh, Amanda Hollingsworth, thank you very much for your very good deed. Now, speaking of that uh, icy cold winter weather, it is on our way to Virginia right now. Our latest forecast for uh, Thursday during the day and then on into Friday morning, we're supposed to get in the Farmville area somewhere between one to three inches of snow and up to an inch of ice. So uh, it could be. My plan is to do a, uh, a show on Thursday, uh, but it is quite possible that the power will be out here on Thursday. Uh, so... If you don't see a new Cam and Company tomorrow, that's why. I'm not slacking. <laughs> We're just without power, uh, and I'm not able to get to the studio. Um, hopefully, still be able to update uh, the website. We'll we'll just kind of have to play things by ear, but hopefully it won't be too bad. Uh, and um, if it does get too bad, hopefully I've got a neighbor like uh, Amanda Hollingsworth who can maybe help me out. So, fingers crossed. I'll see you tomorrow. In the meantime, don't forget to check out BarryAndArms.com throughout the day for the latest Second Amendment news and information. And uh, don't forget as well to subscribe to Town Hall Media on YouTube. That way you'll never miss a program. Or if you like the Rumble, some people like the Rumble, Rumble.com, uh, you can look us up at Barry and Arms Cam and Company. For podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TownHall.com's podcast page. I always forget about that one for some reason. I don't know why. There's some other great podcasts there. Hopefully you have a great rest of your hump day Wednesday. We'll see you soon with more Second Amendment news and information. But until then, be well, be safe, stay warm, and be free.